Be Wealthy and Smart, episode 528. into a world of wealth and financial freedom without budgets, boredom, or bosses on Be Wealthy and Smart. And now, here's your host, Linda P. Jones. Welcome to Be Wealthy and Smart. I'm Linda P. Jones, America's Wealth Mentor, empowering women and men worldwide to financial freedom. On today's show, we're going to talk about an article called The Ultra-Rich Are Investing Differently in 2019, and it includes Cannabis. And I found this on CNBC.com. This was written by Michelle Fox. And it was dated January 31st, 2019. And it has three bullet points. The first bullet point says, super wealthy investors are making some changes to their portfolios for 2019. The second bullet point says, they are increasing their cash holdings and reducing their equity exposure. And the third bullet point says they are also investing in fixed income and cannabis, says Tiger 21 founder Michael Sonnenfeld. And here's the article. Super wealthy investors are making some changes to their portfolios for 2019. They are increasing their cash holdings and reducing their equity exposure. They are also cutting back on some of their real estate investments and finding a short-term solution in fixed income, according to Michael Sonnenfeld, founder of investment club Tiger 21. There's a lot of caution, and some of it is market volatility, he said Thursday on CNBC's Power Lunch. Then there is also the uncertainty of government policy, he added. The members of Tiger 21 are more than 700 strong and have a total of $71 billion in assets. However, there is one growing trend they are hopping aboard, cannabis. The industry has seen a big boost since Canada legalized cannabis for recreational use. While marijuana use is illegal in the U.S. on a federal level, a number of states have legalized it for recreational and or medical use. The stocks of Canadian pot companies like Tilray, which debuted on the NASDAQ last year, and Canopy Growth have since taken off, although not without a lot of wild swings. The rich, though, are looking at more than just public equities when it comes to cannabis. Sometimes it's owning the land that cannabis is grown on. Sometimes it's owning the real estate where there are factories, if you will, and sometimes it's owning the companies. And then, of course, there's the public market, Sonnenfeld said. Another place the wealthy are investing these days is gold. The precious metal has been in a long sump, but prices are now hitting eight-month highs. For one, there has been no new supply of gold in the last eight years, Sonnenfeld noted. Then there is the fact that investors need an alternative to the volatile stock market. Typically, people first think of gold as an inflation hedge, but over history, it's really been an instability hedge, he said. Tiger 21 members, meanwhile, are concerned about the recent proposals to tax the wealthy. However, Sonnenfeld said they are equally worried about a $1 trillion deficit. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office is projecting the U.S. deficit will hit that milestone by 2022. Clearly, we can't run these kinds of deficits, and there has to be some change, perhaps in tax policy, but to tax hard work and to try to redistribute wealth has never created wealth, he said. Finding that balance is really what we need to do. And there's one more paragraph that just goes on. It's a little political, so I'm going to leave that out. It doesn't really have any investment merit to it, but I will post the article on my website and in the show notes so that you can read that if you want. So I have a bunch of comments. I just made some notes after I read this article because this article really struck me because it was exactly going along with what we've been talking about. Now, I don't follow Tiger 21. In fact, I had to do some research to find out more about them. As it said, they are a group of high net worth investors. They are across 29 cities in the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom. 
They do have over $71 billion in assets, and they have 700 members that pay $30,000 a year to be part of their investing group. I'm thinking that this Tiger Club might have come from the original Tiger Hedge Fund that was a very famous hedge fund and spawned off smaller hedge funds that were called Tiger Cubs, and that was way back during the boom of 2000. But I didn't really get the history on that, so I'm not really sure if that's accurate, but I kind of think that that's where it originally sprouted from. Anyway, I think it's very interesting that they are right parallel with what we've been talking about here because you always want to pay attention to where the smart money is going. You always want to pay attention to where the billionaires are investing. And I always say that one of the things I like to do is invest like the billionaires. One of the reasons for that is because they tend to follow cycles. And I know that because when I was researching cycles, I found the people that they follow. And I wrote about them in my book and shared with the average investor the information about cycles that's known by these very, very wealthy people. But it's something that I came across after the big decline in 2008 and started doing some research and came across some people that were using cycles to identify repeating patterns and thereby had some success predicting the future based on repeating patterns. There's all kinds of cycles that come together. Some are short-term cycles, some are medium time cycles, and some are longer time cycles. And so the challenge is not just seeing that a stock might make a low every four weeks or every six weeks, but the challenge is to see when the bigger cycles come into play because every 80 years there's a major cycle, every 30 years there's a major interest rate cycle, there's an 18 year real estate cycle, there's all these different cycles. And so they can combine at different points. And that's where the real talent comes in with these cycle people is understanding how the cycles all work together. Sometimes they're moving up together, sometimes they're moving down together, and sometimes they're not moving in the same direction. So how they interpret that to get some handle on what's going to come in the future is very interesting. But some of them have been able to do it very successfully, such as Paul Tudor Jones, who was able to predict the exact day of the stock market crash, October 19th, 1987, and by doing so was able to make over $100 million in one day because he knew that was the day to load up on his put options and to short the market. He later wrote a book about that and then regretted that he told a secret and tried to buy back all of the copies of the book that he had sold. But these are the things that we know that the high net worth are following. And again, people who aren't familiar with this might think this sounds far-fetched. That's your choice. I've actually researched it quite a bit and I shared that in my book. But I wanna talk today about what these high net worth people do because they tend to move together. And the high net worth often are invested in hedge funds, which gives them more flexibility to invest in different things in the market. They can take higher risk, they can leverage. And also institutions are big investors in the market as well. And it's really not the retail investor that is driving the stock markets. Although the retail investor might be more emotional, they might get more scared and be the one to sell and panic at a bottom whereas a high net worth investor might be buying at a bottom. And this is typical that high net worth investors will be buying when the market drops, but the average retail investor tends to panic and sell when the market drops. So we wanna keep our eye on what are these hedge fund investors, high net worth investors, institutions, what are they investing in? Because they're really the ones that are driving the market. And you see with the hedge fund, they don't have to be diversified. In fact, they're usually not very diversified. They're usually in a small portfolio of stocks and they're very concentrated in that portfolio, similar to what Warren Buffett does. Again, he uses a very concentrated portfolio. By being in certain sectors, we can learn what they think those sectors are going to do. So it was very interesting to me to read that they, like us, 
like the gold sector. I actually like the mining sector. And unlike the price of gold, the mining sector has actually done really well for the last three years. We had GDX and GDXJ be the number one and two ETFs for the last three years. And we had owned those over in my VIP experience. So they had been performing very well to the tune of 16 and 18 and a half percent for three year returns, average annualized returns. So we've been following that gold market for a while, but now the high net worth people are getting into the gold market. And it's interesting too, that they are investing less in real estate. And that's something I've been talking about on this podcast as well that the real estate cycle is getting long in the tooth and this is not something that will go up forever. And that's an unpopular thing for me to say. I think some people get upset when I say that, but I just wanna tell you what my information is and the cycle information that I follow from these high net worth people tells me that real estate is not going to have the performance that it's had. These high net worth people seem to be agreeing with that and lightening up on real estate. And they also agree with us on cannabis, of all things. That kind of blew my mind that this article was saying they are specifically going into cannabis. Now it mentioned Tilray and Canopy Growth. Tilray is not a company that I like. I feel that it's had a lot of volatility because it has very limited shares available for the public. So it's been somewhat of a an artificial boom in Tilray that sent it, you know, up to 300 or thereabouts and now back down to 75. So it's been very volatile. It's been all over the place. I don't own the stock. I'm not going to own that stock. And again, it's it's an artificial demand created by very few shares that they have available. And it also was the first cannabis stock to go public in the United States. So it had a lot of demand and very few shares. And so hence you had this very crazy bubble and volatility in that stock. Canopy Growth, on the other hand, is a company that impresses me. Their CEO, Bruce Linton, is a visionary. I'm not gonna you know, go into details about that stock. When we look at cannabis, they're seeing what we've been talking about, that this is a $500 billion potential market. Simple to get to that valuation with a, with a very easy back of the envelope sketch of, you know, the medicinal uses, the beverages, the foods it could be part of, the cosmetics that it could be part of, the recreational use, uh, the pet and animal uses, such as if horses have anxiety, uh, riding in a trailer, they can be given CBD to calm their anxiety, just all kinds of uses. Uh, The other day I was listening to someone who said that they had a problem with their dog and their dog had an enlarged heart and went to the vet. The vet gave them three prescriptions. They took the prescriptions, they gave the prescriptions to the dog. The dog got worse to the point where he had to be carried outside to even go to the bathroom. And they were really worried the dog was dying. The, they took him back to the vet. The vet said, yes, your dog is dying. He'll probably die, you know, this week and they were devastated. And they happened to have some CBD oil in the house. They gave the dog some drops of CBD. Immediately, the dog started to feel better. After a couple days, took it back to the vet. The vet said there was no more enlarged heart. There was no more liquid on the heart that was causing pressure on the heart. They don't know what caused it, what helped it, but they're saying that they believe it's the CBD oil that helped their animal. Now, I can't tell you if that's what happened or not, but it wouldn't surprise me because there are some tests that are showing incredible research results with cannabis. And this is what companies like Canopy Growth are doing. They are doing medical tests with cannabis. There's different strains and there's different things that make up the cannabis that can be separated out and recombined in a way that can be creating different medicines. And then they're using those different medicines to get patents and 
to test their effectiveness and if they are very effective to have that exclusive patent on that strain or that combination of the strains of the cannabis. So the medicinal uses are very, very exciting, not only for epilepsy and the first epilepsy drug approved uh, under GW Pharmaceuticals, but also other medical uses. So very exciting times for that. And I think that that's what these ultra high net worth investors are seeing is the growth rate of 17% compounded annual growth rate projected, you know, into the next five to 10 years. They're seeing, you know, $500 billion in market cap potential value, very easy to see that worldwide. They're seeing the medical uses, food, beverage, all all those things I've already named. So it's exciting times. And that's what ultra high net worth investors are looking for. They're looking for that growth. Where is the big market? Because a rising tide lifts all boats. However, having said that, I will also say that you have to be careful because I do think that not every cannabis company is going to survive. And it is going to be survival of the fittest. It is going to be those who use their capital wisest. It is going to be those who are not getting caught up in the commodity side of the cannabis, because uh, if a lot of people are growing and it is a simple farm crop, then prices can drop as supply increases. So you want to have a way to differentiate yourself, to create a brand, to create patents, Uh, These are all important parts when you look at investing in cannabis. Just uh, one final comment about the gold. I think one of the reasons why we're seeing some movement in gold right now are the growing deficits and the Fed cutting interest rates or their dovishness with not wanting to raise interest rates. And if the price of gold crosses over $1,400 an ounce, we could see the beginning of another five to 10 year bull market in the precious metals. So very exciting times for the metals. And it seems like we're coming back into that cycle and uh, we'll have to watch and see how that plays out. But we have reported many billionaires are, including Sam Zell, who is well known as a real estate investor who has sold his real estate and has bought gold uh, and other billionaires who have lightened up on other parts of their portfolio, much of it coming from real estate and going into gold. So they definitely are either following a cycle or they're making a prediction or they are getting some sort of information that wants to get them in that sector. And finally, just a last word on cycles that sometimes you see high net worth investors agree on certain things like when we're going to have a recession. And recently Warren Buffett and Ray Dalio, both billionaires, multi-billionaires, came out and said they think there will be a recession in 2020. I think that's coming from cycle information that they're following, which is saying that we'll have an important low in the market in 2020 and that it's going to be coming from a recession. Just, you know, some of the cycle information I've been hearing out there, there's lots of different sources for it. You can find different people that follow it. Again, my favorites I've talked about in my book, but I do get cycle information from a lot of different sources. I'm always testing different people who are cycle followers to see who is the accurate one and to see who really has a good handle on this. Because as you can imagine, this is not something that the ultra high net worth just want to let out for everyone, but they usually will give some hints like what they think is coming if there's a big recession or something like that, an important low they see coming, they'll often make a remark about it. And you'll notice that sometimes those multi-billionaires will agree that it's at the same point. And you're thinking, well, that's really interesting. Why are they all saying 2020? Well, it's because they all follow the same people and they have the same research, but they don't really want to tell you that. So Anyway, that's my opinion. You can differ with that if you want. Again, I'm sure some people who haven't really studied cycles and because it's unfamiliar territory, uh, it may sound like something really goofy. But if you really put the time in to understand how our planet has 3,600 cycles 
and it's the way the world works. We haven't been taught how the world works in many ways. So it happens to be my belief that that is an important investment edge. I just wanted to share that with you. And I was stunned to find this article and find this particular group of high net worth investors, the Tiger 21, who are basically on the same track that we are. (laughs) So I just thought I'd share that with you. That's the kind of information and the quality of information you're getting by listening to this podcast. So there you go. I feel really, really uh, humbled and uh, excited to share that with you. I thought that was pretty cool. If you're interested in joining my VIP experience, my inner circle investing group, There is an application to complete in the show notes and set up an appointment and have a strategy session with me. If we haven't yet connected on Instagram, go on over to instagram.com forward slash Linda P. Jones and get my daily wealth tips. Also, the Wealth Heiress book is back in stock on Amazon and amazon.uk and on the programs page of my website if either of those websites won't work for you because you are an international buyer, perhaps. Or if you want it personalized for you, I'm happy to do that on my website. And don't forget, through the end of February, I've added 15 additional prizes. And so you can win five of my Wealthy Mindset Blueprint audio sets valued at $197, five Wealth Heiress books personalized by me, or five Wealth Mentoring sessions with me. And that drawing will be done March 1st. All you have to do is leave a podcast review. Your name goes in the drawing five times. A book review, your name goes in the drawing seven times. If you do both, your name goes in the drawing 10 times. And thank you to everyone who has already done a review. I so appreciate it. And you're still entered in the drawing. And if you haven't yet completed our 10 question survey, I would really appreciate it if you could answer the 10 questions, let me know more about you so I can tailor make podcasts just for our audience. And it allows you to share any obstacles that you're having or suggestions that you have for me as well. And thank you to everybody who has completed the survey. I so appreciate it. You guys are awesome. That's all for today. Until next time, live the good life and be wealthy and smart. Thank you for listening to Be Wealthy and Smart with Linda P. Jones. Share the wealth and tell your family and friends about the show. Check out our website, blog, and social media for more riches at www.bewealthyandsmart.com.